All right, welcome back to Physics 272. Um, today, we are talking about um, superconductors, uh, which is going to be fun because superconductors can do something called magnetic levitation. So I'll show that to you. But one of the exciting things about that is that we can think about ways to make levitating trains, for example. Something exciting about levitation is that if something's riding on air, it's rather frictionless. So you can think of saving a lot of energy by making frictionless trains, basically, um, as well as a lot of other cool applications of superconductors. Last time, we discussed Faraday's law from many different angles. And the, so I've got up here all the statements of Faraday's law that we made last time. Look at the, the two inside expressions. So that's the traditional way to express Faraday's law in the form of a typical Maxwell equation. And that said that integral e dot dl is minus d by dt of integral b dot n dA. So that relates the uh, electric field line integral around a loop to the changes in magnetic flux through the loop. So just to remind you how this went, when you see an integral with a circle on it, it means close the object. So if it's a line integral, here this is a line integral, L stands for line. So the line integral of e dot dl around a line if there's a circle on the integral, it needs to come back to its original spot. If you have a circle on a surface integral, that means close the surface. So how do I know if a surface is open or closed? The analogy we talked about was blowing bubbles. So if you take, take a bubble wand and dip it into the bubble solution, when you pull the wand out, you've got a soap film over the bubble wand. That's an open surface because there's no inside or outside. Right? Can't tell the difference between inside or outside on an open surface. But if I blow an actual bubble, a bubble has an inside and an outside. So something that has an inside or an outside is a closed surface. So when you see those circles on the integrals, they're there for a reason. There's not a circle on this integral. <laughs> and there's not a circle there for a reason. And so the reason here is that this area that you're supposed to integrate over on the right is related to the path of your line integral on the left-hand side. So the line integral on the left-hand side is a closed loop, okay? Very much like a bubble wand. And then the area you're supposed to integrate over on the right is like the soap film that would be on the bubble wand. Okay, so those are, that's how those guys are related. And we saw that integral e dot dl around the loop is something we can also call EMF. So you can use it to drive a current if you have an actual loop of wire in there. And we had another way to express minus d by dt integral b dot n dA is that we call that minus dt, d by dt of phi, where phi stands for magnetic flux. It, phi is just the same thing as that integral b dot n dA. Do you have any questions from last time? <coughs> okay. So today, we're moving on to two big topics, superconductors and inductors. And uh, we're going to spend more time on superconductors than inductors because uh, superconductors play heavily in my own research. So I'm pretty excited to get to tell you about superconductors. But let me start by reminding you what metals are like. So from a very young age, you've learned how to identify a metal without even doing a really difficult experiment on them, OK? What, what do we use metals for? We use metals to conduct electricity, to move current from one spot to another, all right? Uh, metals are what's carrying the current around up in the ceilings to power the lights. Metals are inside these wires here. Okay, but you don't have to do a complicated experiment to spot a metal. You can spot them by eye, okay? You, you know that metals are shiny. They're smooth, typically smooth on their surface. And they're malleable. Malleable just means they're, they're bendable. So, for example, this wire, there's a copper wire inside here, and it bends rather than breaking when I, when I, um, when I try to, to, to put some pressure on it. And of course, the technologically important aspect of a metal is that it carries current. It conducts electricity, which is why we use them everywhere to carry currents around. So they're very important technologically. Now, <clears throat> as you know, all metals, even though they're really good conductors, they're not perfect conductors, OK? So there is a little bit of resistance that's inside of every metal. And so that leads to power dissipation, OK? Because if, if we have a dissipative material, we can say that the power dissipated is IV, all right? Or you can relate that again to I squared R, where R is the resistance of the material. And so when you have a non-zero resistance of a material, that material always radiates away heat as it conducts electricity. So that means that, you know, think about our power grid, okay? Our, our power grid 
is what we use in order to get electricity from the power plant where we generated it to your house or to a building or to a factory. So all along those transmission lines, this power dissipation is dissipating at I squared R. So they're giving off a lot of heat and they're just losing energy the whole time that you're carrying this electricity. So you pay for more electricity than you ever receive because these transmission lines are leaky. Now can you imagine if the water delivery system in a city did that? Can you imagine if your water pipes just kind of leaked the whole way and about half the water that the water company put out you know, got to you? All right, uh, you wouldn't put up with that, would you? All right, but in fact, we're putting up with it in our, in our energy transmission lines. The physical reason it happens is that electrons scatter off of the lattice. The lattice is, is uh, our name for the regular arrangement of atoms that are inside the solid, and so the, the electrons lose energy. So as we've talked about before, we can make an analogy between how electrons move in a metal and how a runner would run on the top of all these desks. So the top of the desks represent the atoms, and they're in a regular arrangement inside of a solid. And what electrons do is they look out over that lattice, and they say, aha, I can do this. All I have to do is run on top of the desks at the right rhythm, bam, 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 and I'll be able to go as fast as I want. Well, not quite as fast as I want, but I can go pretty well. I can go in any direction, and I can just see, okay, there's a rhythm, and if I hit the right rhythm, I can do it. The clinch is that what happens is that there's finite temperature involved, right? Every thing around us has a particular temperature to it. And the higher the temperature, the more the atoms wiggle. So you have to imagine that it doesn't look quite like this to an electron inside of a material. It looks like, imagine all these desks just kind of jiggly wiggling, okay? And so what'll happen is that as the electron tries to run along at the right rhythm, it'll eventually hit a desk at the wrong time. It'll be, just be wiggling at the wrong time. It crashes into the, into the desk, okay? Or, or what happens is that the electron then loses all of its energy to the atoms, and then it has to pick itself back up again. The electric field kicks it, and it starts moving again. So it's that scattering process that causes metals to have a finite resistivity. So if we could figure out how to get rid of all that wiggling, we could make, um, well, we could make better conductors. So that's, that's certainly one way to do it. Okay, so can we reduce that resistivity? Here's a plot of what happens if you take a metal and you measure it as a function of temperature. So this is resistivity versus temperature. Resistivity is kind of a normalized way to talk about resistance. So if I talk about resistance, I actually have to tell you something about the geometry of the object that's carrying the current. But if I define it as resistivity, then the resistivity of copper is the resistivity of copper. Just think of it as resistance on this plot, okay? And so what we find is that as we lower the temperature, the resistance goes down and down, which is great. So what's happening is that as you lower the temperature, those atoms wiggle less and they wiggle less and they wiggle less. And there's less times then that the electrons coming through whack into an atom that's out of place. So that's great, but it didn't, it didn't go on forever. Look at that. There's some temperature. <laughs> there's some temperature at which it just levels off. You might have thought you could make that resistivity go all the way down to zero at zero temperature, but it just levels off. Does anybody know what happened there? This is actually really, really low temperatures at this point. But can you, can you kind of make a guess as to why it would just level off? That's kind of weird. Okay. Pardon? Oh, okay. oh hey, uh, maybe a phase transition happened. That's an excellent idea. Maybe a phase transition happened. What's happening in, in this case, and, and actually that's always one of the things we think about in, um, in doing theory of materials, is we always think about, was there a phase transition somewhere? In this case, what's going on is that you hit quantum. That's what happens. There's some low temperature at which quantum just throws up a roadblock and says, that's it. Have you heard of something called zero-point energy? Okay, zero-point energy. Is, um, the fact that when I turn the temperature down on all those atoms, yes, they'll, they'll wiggle less and they'll wiggle less, but then at some point they'll hit the quantum limit. And quantum says everything has to be wiggling all the time just a little bit. That's zero point energy. So what will happen is that at some point you hit the quantum limit. So down here there's quantum fluctuations that are required. They have to happen. And it's kind of like every little atom is like a little three-year-old that can't quite sit still. Okay? So it's just a little bit of wiggling that has to happen. So that wiggling is always going to cause electrons to scatter in metals. So, so we can't get the metal to behave perfectly. But there's this other type of material called a superconductor, and something quite different happens when you measure its resistivity versus temperature. You see kind of roughly the same thing as you lower the temperature, the resistivity goes down, and there's less scattering events, and then all of a sudden, bam, whoa, the floor drops out, and there's zero resistance left. 
That's pretty cool, okay? And this was phenomenon was uh, first discovered back in 1911, and then over time, people have discovered more and more materials that superconduct, and nowadays, we can find superconductors that work all the way up to 160 Kelvin, which is still pretty cold to you and me, but it's pretty good compared to the first discovery in 1911 of a 4 Kelvin superconductor. So, uh, superconductors have these properties. They carry current perfectly. This pretty picture I'm showing you, by the way, is, um, is a polarized uh, microscopy picture of one of the, the modern um, ceramic superconductors. So it's just to show you that it's got kind of an interesting crystal structure to it. That image is where they send in polarized light and then watch the polarization <coughs> that bounces off and then they false color it. But the important thing is that, okay, there's a material that superconducts that's got some interesting properties. Um, they carry current perfectly. And I mean perfectly, not just almost perfectly, not just really well. They actually carry current without losing any energy as they do it. So somehow, so for example, if we made a loop, let's make a loop of superconductor, okay? Make a loop of superconductor, get a current started in it, and walk away, okay? You could come back five years later and you'd find the same current is still going there. It never lost its energy. It's really cool. And there's another interesting effect that goes along with this, which is uh, called the Meissner effect, which is that superconductors, when they're in their superconducting state, they not only can they carry current forever, because they don't lose their energy when they're carrying current, they also expel magnetic fields. And that's kind of the, the dramatic one that Tosunumi here is representing for us. So because superconductors expel magnetic fields, all right, that means they repel magnets. Right? You try to get a magnet near the superconductor, the superconductor says, no way, Jose, and won't let the magnetic field lines inside of itself. And so here's an example of that. This is Tosunumi, the sumo wrestler. The point of showing you Tosunumi's statistics is that he's heavy, okay? And he's standing on top of some magnets. He's on a magnetic platform. Hidden under here is a bunch of superconductors with the liquid nitrogen that's necessary to keep them at a low enough temperature to work. You can see there's a little air gap there. So it's a pretty robust effect. Um, and I can, I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to show you um, our demonstration of that, okay? So this is one of, uh, so I'm just going to, well, I better not carry that around, I'll drop it and we'll never find it again. So this is an example of um, one of the modern cuprate superconductors. This is a high temperature superconductor. It works around 100 Kelvin, okay? And you can just kind of look at it. Does that look metallic to you? You're pretty good at identifying metals by eye. Okay, is it shiny? Not shiny, right? Okay, so it's not shiny. And here, just feel of that. Does, I mean, does that feel like a metal? No. No, it kind of feels like a, a plate, right? Like a ceramic plate or something like that. Okay. It, I mean, this guy is weird in that it's, it's, it's a ceramic, okay? And it's clearly not a metal, all right? It's not shiny. And yet this little pellet here um, superconducts at like 100 Kelvin. So somehow, even though it looks like a material that should not have any business conducting at all, because it's black, it's not shiny, and it's a ceramic, it's not malleable, you know, it has none of these properties that we're used to in something that's a good conductor. And yet if you get it cold enough, it becomes a better conductor than metal. It becomes a superconductor. So let me show you that. One of the consequences of superconductivity is that the thing should expel magnetic fields. So I have right here, okay, I have two magnets, okay, and they, they snap together, but they don't have any interaction with that superconducting pellet, okay? So when the pellet's warm, there's no big deal. But if I could get that guy to superconduct, then it would behave quite differently with respect to the magnet. So I'm going to pour some liquid nitrogen in. This is a superconductor that will superconduct. If you get it colder than about 100 Kelvin, it'll superconduct. Liquid nitrogen temperature is about 77 Kelvin, so that's cold enough. And so we're cooling that superconductor down right now. See the nice boiling of the liquid nitrogen? Always a good day in class when we use liquid nitrogen, right? So now I'm going to take this magnet and uh, see if we can see that um, that the superconductor expels magnetic fields. So remember before there was no interaction. Now the superconductor is cold. You see how it just kind of popped it off. It does not like that magnet. Okay, so now the magnet is floating. And uh, if I'm careful, I can get the magnet spinning. All right. Can you guys see that in the back? That it's spinning? And 
So that's really nice. When you float something on air like that and you levitate something, it's frictionless. So this guy will go a long time. This is part of why people are interested in using the concept to say have a magnetic, uh, sorry, have a magnetic levitation train. All right, right. If you could translate this into something really large scale, you could have a train that's just frictionless, and so it, co it costs a lot less energy to drive the thing. So um, that's showing you that the superconductor expels magnetic fields. Now we'd like to know something about how does that happen. Wouldn't we all like to know how does this superconductivity phenomenon happen? How is it that a superconductor, once it gets cold enough, can carry electricity perfectly without losing any energy. Part of what's going on right here with the Meissner effect, uh, with, with the fact that the superconductor expels magnetic field, the way it's doing it is, is when it's, okay, so this is a warm pellet. It doesn't superconduct. It has no interaction with the magnet. But if it were cold enough like that one, then what happens is I get the magnet nearby. The superconductor says, oh, no, you don't. And it starts spontaneous currents in itself spontaneously start some current so as to repel that magnet. And it can do that because it doesn't cost any energy to run a current in a superconductor. So that's what that guy's doing. It's spontaneously generating currents in order to keep uh, the magnet off of itself. So, so how does it happen? How can this thing run currents without losing any energy? So this brings us to our clicker pole. And it's just a pole, participation points only. And the poll is, can two pieces of matter occupy the same space at the same time? Can two pieces of matter be in the same spot at the same time? No right or wrong answer, just taking a poll. All right, what do you, what do you think of it? Again, this is just a poll, so uh, what, what are you thinking? Can matter occupy the same spot at the same time? Have you ever seen it happen? Okay, you haven't seen it happen. In fact, you, you typically see quite the opposite, right? So you typically see that if I try to pass my hands through each other, I cannot pass them through each other, okay? I, I can't, this is why I can clap, right? Rather than my hands passing through each other. I can't, I'm not falling through the floor, right? Uh, I can't be in the same spot as the floor at the same time. And you know, you're sitting on your chair rather than falling through it. So it sure seems that two pieces of matter can't occupy the same spot at the same time. But it turns out that that's only half true. Okay? In the normal matter around us, in the everyday experience kind of matter, there's two kinds of particles. Okay? And so now we're thinking about the very smallest bits, the electrons, protons, and things like that. So there's two kinds of particles. There's fermions, which include electrons and protons and neutrons, all the stuff that we're made of. All right? Those guys cannot occupy the same spot at the same time. All right? And you learned this in chemistry when you learned the Pauli exclusion principle as far as how to put electrons into atoms. And you would put an electron in the 1s state, the lowest energy state, and you'd put a spin up electron in there. And then you'd spin a, put a spin down electron in there. And then when somebody handed you a third electron, it couldn't go into that state anymore because of the Pauli exclusion principle. So the third electron had to go into the 2s state. That was the Pauli exclusion principle. That's because electrons are fermions. They can't occupy the same space at the same time. They can't be in the same state at the same time. And so essentially, fermions are antisocial. They avoid each other, right? There's something else called bosons, though, all right? So bosons, an example of a boson that you're familiar with is a photon. Photon is just a little packet of light energy. Those guys can mm -hmm. occupy the same space at the same time. And in fact, they really like to. They all follow the crowd. Rather than avoiding each other, they actually all like to flock together and do the same thing. So electrons, again, OK, so electrons are fermions. They obey the Pauli exclusion principle. And this is why most matter cannot occupy the same space at the same time. It's why I can't pass my hands through each other. It's why atoms have the structure that they have. And here's Club Pauli, maximum occupancy, one fermion. OK, only one fermion allowed at a time. That's what the Pauli exclusion principle says. Bosons do something different. Okay? So if you could find bosonic particles, they, they not only are allowed to be in the same state at the same time, they're not only allowed to sit right on top of each other. Okay? If we had two bosonic people, they could just sit in the same chair. Three bosonic people could all sit in the same chair, no problem. Okay? It's a good thing people aren't made of bosons. All right. Now photons, though, are bosons. Okay? Photons, little particles of light, are bosons. And this is part of how lasers work. So I have a laser pointer right here, and you see that nice bright dot of light on the screen. What's going on is that we're pumping photons all into the exact same state, and that's what's making that beam of light, that coherent beam of light, so bright. 
So photons are something in your everyday experience, okay, that, um, that shows this principle that bosons can do the same thing at the same time. There's, some, there's another example that I, I wish we could show you, which is that if you take, um, <clears throat> turns out, if you take two fermions and you can convince two fermions to use the buddy system and come together, two fermions as a pair make a boson. That's kind of weird, all right? And so if you have an even number of fermions, there's a counting to it. So if I have two fermions, the set is a boson. If I have three fermions, the set acts like a fermion again. But if I have four fermions, the set acts like a boson again. So if I make a helium atom, okay, two protons, two electrons, the whole helium atom has an even number of fermions, and it turns out the whole e helium atom itself can act like a boson. And that means you can coax a set of helium atoms. If you, if you take them to a very low temperature, what will happen is that the helium atoms will all inside this, this container, each helium atom will try to find the lowest energy state. And then its other helium atoms will also try to find the lowest energy state, and it turns out they can share it. So all the helium atoms can share the lowest energy state, and then your liquid will become what's called a superfluid. And bizarre things happen. It loses all viscosity, it turns out. If you tried to stir it with a stir stick, it would feel like nothing was there. It even does this bizarre thing in that it somehow creeps out of the uh, container it's in. So always uh, screw the top on your lid of superfluid, OK, so it doesn't spill out, OK? All right, so bosons can do some rather weird stuff. So at low temperature, bosons flock to the lowest energy level. So because, because two bosons can sit in the same energy level or in the same space or in the same state at the same time, they do. If I take a bunch of bosons and I turn the temperature down on them, they all find the lowest energy state and they can all share it. It would be like they all start sitting in the same chair. Okay? Maybe you've heard of Bose-Einstein condensation with, with really cold atoms. That's what's going on. They're all sitting in the same chair. And so not only can bosons do this, they like to do it. And if you turn the temperature down on them, they absolutely will do it. So here's what's interesting. This leads to superfluidity of helium. It leads to Bose-Einstein condensation. And it also is the reason that superconductivity is happening inside that pellet. So <clears throat> how can superconductivity come from bosons? So, so here's what's happening inside of a superconductor. So remember our analogy for what it's like to be an electron inside of a metal. Right? On the electron, the, the tops of the disks are like the atoms inside of a metal. And the problem was that as the electron tries to run along, okay, if it gets the right rhythm, it's pretty good. But then there's always wiggling atoms. And the atoms wiggle out of place. And so the electron trips and falls. When it trips and falls, what happens is that the electron loses energy, right? It loses its kinetic energy, imparts it to the lattice. And, and what happens is that that electron was in a particular state, a particular energy state, trips and falls, loses its energy, and it has to fall into a lower energy state, right? OK, so what would happen if the electron was already in its lowest energy state? So it turns out, if you can make some bosons happen, then you can make use of that. So here's how it would go. So consider taking two electrons. So now we're going to pretend I've cloned myself, OK? And then I'll lock arms with my buddy, all right? And we'll form a pair, all right? And so when you get two electrons to form a pair, two fermions makes one boson, OK? So now I've got a boson. So I need a buddy up here, OK? But anyway, imagine there's two of me, and now we're a pair, and now we're a boson. So now all the bosons in the system could all go to the lowest energy state. So we turn the temperature down. All the bosonic pairs of electrons find the lowest energy state, and they can all be in the exact same lowest energy state because they're bosons, OK? No problem. So now what happens? Now if me and my buddy, if, if our boson pair tries to run along the lattice, we're already in the lowest energy state. So what would happen if we tried to trip over an atom? Well, if we tried to trip over an atom, we'd have to fall into a lower energy state, right? In order for, for my pair to lose energy, there'd have to be a lower energy state for me to fall into. And yet, if I'm already in the lowest energy state, there is no lower energy state to fall into. Okay? Does that make sense? That if the pair is already in the lowest energy state, tries to scatter off of something, but it can't because there's no lower energy state for it to fall into. So here's the really cool thing. Quantum mechanics then forbids that pair of electrons from tripping. It just can't trip. Cannot trip because there's no lower energy state for it to go into. And that's how a superconductor works. A superconductor makes the electrons pair into bosons. You lower the temperature with the liquid nitrogen. The bosons all go into the lowest energy state. 
Since they're already in the lowest energy state, they can't lose energy. So they just carry current without losing energy. They're quantum mechanically forbidden to, to trip. They just can't do it. So that's how this guy's working. So you're actually already familiar with this idea of quantum stability, that when something's in its lowest energy state, its lowest energy quantum state, it can't lose any more energy. So if I think about how atoms behave, you've, you've already seen this kind of phenomenon of quantum stability of the lowest energy state. So think about an excited atom. So think of just a hydrogen atom. Let's just go back to what you learned in chemistry class, one proton, one electron. And if the uh, atom is in, a, in an excited state, maybe the electron's up in the 3s energy level, and then it could release a photon of energy and drop down to the 2s level. Okay, so maybe it's an excited atom, releases some energy in the, in the uh, form of a photon and becomes a less excited atom, like the 2s state. Okay, maybe it could release another photon and then drop down, bam, into the 1s state, which would be its lowest energy state. Now, let's just kind of think about, well, what, what does the lowest energy state look like for an atom? It's a 1s state. If you've seen the drawings of it in chemistry, you know it kind of looks like a ball. What's going on is that the electron is zooming around, and it's zooming around so fast that it fills space. It looks like a fuzzy ball. It's very much like when you turn a fan on, right? The fan blades are, are distinct solid objects. But when you turn the fan blade on, it, it fills space. Same thing with the electron. It's moving so fast in the 1s state, it fills space and makes a fuzzy ball. Now, you might ask, why is that its lowest energy state? Why in the world doesn't this electron, which is attracted to the proton, right? They're attracted to each other. Why doesn't the electron just, say, radiate out another photon and bam, go sit on the proton? Oh no, we just made all the atoms in the universe collapse, right? Okay, so the reason that doesn't happen is because for quantum mechanical reasons, which you're welcome to ask me about afterwards, for quantum mechanical reasons, that 1s state is the lowest energy state. There is no, lowest, no lower energy state. So try as it might, okay, that electron zooming around the proton cannot lose any more energy and fall to a lower energy state. 1s is it. 1s is the bottom. So you're already used to this idea of quantum stability of the lowest energy state. What something's in its lowest energy state, it, it can't lose any more energy. Okay? So this is why, this is why atoms are stable. <laughs> Thank goodness atoms are stable or we couldn't have life in this universe. All right, do you have any questions so far? It's kind of a lot of quantum to throw at you, but hopefully fun quantum, okay? All right, so this is what's happening in that superconductor over there, which I see our superconductor needs some more liquid nitrogen. But this is the basic story, all right? The way the, way the superconductor um, is able to carry current without losing any energy at all is that the electrons pair, those pairs are then bosons, Bosons, when you lower the temperature on them, they all find the lowest energy state, okay? The lowest energy state can't lose energy anymore. It's already in the lowest energy state. So then the electron pairs can carry current without losing any energy. Um, and I'm just gonna start this again because it's uh, too much fun to watch this thing levitate. So the only thing you gotta do is keep it supplied with liquid nitrogen to keep the thing cold, um, and then it, it works again. So <laughs> what my field of study is trying to do is to understand more in detail how these superconductors work so that we can build better ones. And you know, obviously, what we'd love to do is figure out how to make that work without the liquid nitrogen, right? We'd like for it to work at room temperature. So that's kind of the ultimate holy grail of my field is to figure out these guys enough to where we can control them and build better superconductors and make ones that work at room temperature. And if you can make ones that work at room temperature, you could replace all the pieces of the, of the power grid, you know, all those transmission lines that are losing energy all the time, just replace them with superconductors and you won't lose energy. Um, so to go a long way towards solving the, uh, the energy crisis. Any questions so far? All right. All right, uh, this is a chart of uh, at what temperature these things work, right? The one I'm showing you superconducts at 100 Kelvin, okay? It's a cuprate superconductor. But this is, this is just the chain of discovery over time. The first superconductor was discovered in 1911. So it turns out that mercury superconducts if you get it down to about 4 Kelvin. And that was an amazing discovery. And then over time, people discovered new materials that also superconduct. So this is a chart of what's the highest known 
temperature at which we can make a superconductor work. And over time, it's been marching up and marching up. And you know, it seemed to have petered out around 30 Kelvin for a, a, a long time. And then there was a new discovery um, in, in the 80s that, bam, all of a sudden we had 100 Kelvin superconductors. And that's the kind I'm showing you right now. It's a cuprate superconductor. And so you know, our hope is that over time, as we develop new materials, we'll be able to eventually make those transition temperatures continue to go up. So these, these ones that I'm, I'm showing you here are cuprate high temperature superconductors. And, and uh, you know, you've already seen some of the mysteries of these guys, right? I mean, they're, they're black, right? They're not shiny. They don't look metallic. Why in the world do they work? Um, they, they look like they have no business conducting electricity, right? Because they're not shiny. They're not malleable. They're, they're ceramic, in fact. So if I were to drop it and step on it, it could we'd crush and break just like, just like a plate, just like a ceramic plate. Um, turns out they even have a little bit of magnetism inside, which is kind of weird. And uh, if you have the right equipment, you can make your own. Uh, there's a, um, a high school chemistry lab that, you know, where you know, high school students make these things. They're not that hard to make. You just put the materials in a crucible, mix it up, bake it at the right temperature, a very high temperature, and bam, out pops a working superconductor. Now, we would love to know how these new materials work, all right? And when I say we don't know how they work, what I mean is that, I mean, I'm a theorist, okay? I, I, I'm a theoretical physicist. I, I study these things. This is, what I, this is what my research is about, is these guys and, and other materials like that. So, you know, of course, I know how they work, right? Okay? So a lot of people in my field know how they work. We just don't agree on how they work. We have a lot of ideas. And so that's where the state of the field is. We have a lot of ideas about how they might work. So that's what we uh, go to conferences and, and uh, politely discuss physics about is how these guys work. So anyway, if you want to read a little bit about my research on these things, there's a, a link to that and that, that's in the lecture notes. You can get that off of Blackboard Learn. So one of the things that's really cool about superconductors is that not only do they carry current without losing energy, so they would go a long way towards solving our energy crisis, we're showing right here that they have this magnetic levitation property. Okay? A similar property, okay, one of the ways we can understand this magnetic levitation, is that it turns out the magnetic flux through a superconducting ring is forbidden to change. Now, one of the things that we talked about last time is Lenz's rule. Okay? <laughs> Lenz's rule was the idea that if I have a loop of wire, a loop of regular metallic wire, and I have a certain amount of magnetic flux through it, the loop of wire tends to oppose changes in its magnetic flux. So that is, if you change the amount of magnetic flux through it, the wire tends to start some current so as to generate a magnetic field to oppose that change. Um, but it's a transient small effect, OK? It turns out for a superconductor, the superconductor can do this perfectly. And so in a superconductor, if I had a superconducting ring and I had a particular magnetic flux through the superconducting ring, it can never change <laughs> as long as it's superconducting. If I wanted to change it, I'd have to raise the temperature so it's no longer a superconductor, and then I could change the flux. So here's how we can see that. We can actually show you that from Faraday's law. So you already know Faraday's law, that integral E dot dl is minus d by dt of the magnetic flux through the ring. Okay? So let's say that we tried to do this in a superconductor. Let's say that we try to change the magnetic flux. That would then cause a finite E dot dl around the ring. All right, so assume we did that. Assume we have a finite integral E dot dl around the ring. Because the resistance is zero in a superconductor, this would mean then that the current in the superconductor would go to infinity, right? So V equals IR means that here in our superconductor, I is EMF over R. And because R goes to zero, any finite EMF would cause an infinite current, right? And so that's just not possible. That's impossible. So we are forced to conclude, <laughs> okay, be, be, because we can't make an integral E dot dl be finite in a superconductor without costing an infinite amount of energy. It's just not possible. We're forced to conclude that d by dt of the magnetic flux must always be zero for a superconducting ring. And this is related to the reason that this superconductor here is expelling that magnetic field, okay? Part of what's going on here is that the, um, the superconductor itself doesn't want that magnetic field changing in its interior, so it spontaneously <coughs> generates current so as to keep its flux constant. Do you have any questions so far about that? OK. All right, does, does no questions mean concept's good, or we should spend more time on it? Oh, yeah, please. So it produces a variable amount of current? 
Yeah, well, the, the superconductor, the, this demo that we're showing right here, absolutely. Yeah, so and I can, I can, yeah, so it's right now generating current. Well, it's got current running in it, let's say, in order to keep that magnet afloat. That's how it's doing it. The superconductor is spontaneously making a little electromagnet inside of itself. And then as I change the height of the magnet, the superconductor is responding immediately in order to, to, to change the current that it's running. And, and right now it's changing a lot, right? So oh, no, no, it's having to adjust a lot as that thing spins around. Yeah. Good question. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> That's a good question. I can't do it directly, so I would have to infer it from the magnetic field. So, and, and, and a lot of people do that. So they infer it from uh, the shape of the material and the shape of the magnetic field lines that are going through it. So to do that, um, so it's indirect. It's indirect. Um, but the, the way to do that really carefully is to have a very well-controlled shape of the magnetic field that you apply and a very well-controlled and well-engineered shape of the superconducting material itself. And so there's, there's, a, there's groups at uh, University of British Columbia that specialize in that and have very carefully calculated these things inside of superconductors. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, you, okay, so it turns out you can run a current through them, okay? It, it, it's just that um, it turns out that you can't have a voltage across them. That's the weird thing. So you can take the electrons that are in there and move them along. There's no resistance. There's no resistance, therefore, as you do it, there's no voltage, okay? So you can do it without, without a voltage drop. Yeah, it's a bit weird. It's a bit weird, yeah. Qu questions? Yeah, anytime you hit a real zero in physics, right, it always causes all these strange paradoxes. But you're bringing up all the paradoxes that, that come up, yeah. Other questions so far? OK. All right, so this, um, the fact that the flux can't change is related to the fact that superconductors expel magnetic fields. And it's related to why Tosunumi could float and why our magnet over there is floating over the superconductor and why you can make a levitating train out of superconductors if you have enough liquid nitrogen, OK? So in this case, they've got the magnets on the bottom and the superconductors riding inside the train in a little bitty pool of liquid nitrogen. All right, now I'm going to tell you just a little bit about inductance and the time we have left in class. So switching tracks entirely, let me tell you about inductance. OK, so inductance uh, is, is, well, in inductance happens when you have something called an inductor. An inductor is when I have loops of wire that are in a coil, OK? That makes something an inductor. And so uh, you've already learned about a solenoid. A solenoid is where we have several loops of wire together. And the purpose of doing that is to make a nice electromagnet, because inside of those loops, uh, of a solenoid, when we run current through it, we get a nice uniform magnetic field on the inside of the solenoid in the form of mu naught n i over d. d is the length of the solenoid, n is the number of turns of wire. Okay? So you can get a nice strong magnetic field this way. Remember, last class we had um, a, su a, um, uh, a solenoid coil that had about 300 turns in it. So n can be pretty big, and then you get yourself a nice big magnetic field. Now, it turns out that because of Faraday's law, Okay, because changes in magnetic flux cause EMFs, right? Uh, because of that, it's hard to change the current inside of a solenoid. So here we've got a solenoid set up, and we want to think about, well, how hard is it to change that current? So let's think first about steady state, okay? So steady state has that the magnetic field is mu naught n i over d. Steady state is where I apply this current, and I wait long enough that ever, all the transients settled out. Now, let the current change, OK? What's going to happen if the current changes? If the current changes, then the magnetic field will change, right? So if the current changes, magnetic field changes. That magnetic field change will then change the flux in all the other loops. So all the other loops say, oh no, the flux changed. And remember Lenz's law. Lenz's law is that if the magnetic flux changes through a loop of wire, the loop of wire tries to spontaneous, well, spontaneously generates a little current to oppose that change of flux. So all along the solenoid, every loop of wire is fighting this change. It's all got a little bit of Lenz's law effect in it, and it all fights the change. So it takes a, a while to reach steady state in an inductor because of that. So let's calculate that effect. 
So let the current change. As that happens, that'll induce an EMF in every loop. That's the Lenz's law effect. There'll be a, a back effect on every loop trying to oppose that change. So the EMF of every loop will be d phi by dt, okay, which is d by dt of the magnetic field times the area in the loop. So the magnetic field, we already said, is mu naught ni over d in the solenoid. And then the area of each loop is pi r squared. So now I want to take that derivative. And the only thing changing with time in here is the current, because I'm going to let the current change a little bit. So everything else is a constant, so just pull it out. And then I have mu naught n over d, pi r squared, that's constants out in front, times d by dt of the current. The current's the thing that's going to change. So in every single loop, as I change the current, I get this EMF response. Okay? That's just the, the Lenz's law of Faraday uh, effect. Now, that was every loop. <laughs> So each loop has that EMF on it. And, but I've got a lot of loops. I've got a whole solenoid's worth of loops. I've got n loops. So every single loop contributes this EMF to the whole solenoid. So the EMF total across the entire solenoid is n, the number of loops, times the EMF of each loop. So I just need to take this expression and multiply by n. So that gives me mu naught n squared over d pi r squared di by dt. Okay. And this induced EMF opposes that changing current. It doesn't like to have the current, it doesn't like to have the uh, magnetic flux change through all those loops. That's, that's Lenz's law. But we can build that up and see that effect. Uh, so first, let's simplify the equation a little bit, OK? All these constant out, out in front, I'm going to call L. And L is the inductance. So L, the inductance, is all those guys in front. That's the definition of inductance L, three Three bars for the equal signs means defined as. So then the inductance of a solenoid is mu naught n squared over d pi r squared, where n is the number of turns. So you think about that, though. If I have 300 turns, right, then n squared is a rather large number, right? 300 times 300 is pretty big. So that's the inductance of the solenoid. So we're going to keep that on the next page. There's the inductance of the solenoid again. And where that goes in the equation is that the total EMF across the solenoid is L, the inductance, times di by dt. Now, I can also relate the EMF. Okay, so think about the EMF across the entire solenoid. All right, now I can use V equals IR to say, all right, there's some V equals IR total EMF across the whole solenoid. So if I think about it that way, I can say, okay, EMF across the whole solenoid is equal to the current in the solenoid, right, times the net resistance of the whole thing. Does that make sense? I, I just used V equals IR. All right, you okay with that? All right, so now the mathematicians just got very excited, right? Because now I've related I, the current, directly to its time derivative, di by dt. And all the mathematicians went, yee it's about time we had another differential equation in class, right? I know you're all thinking that. So differential equation just showed up because I have I directly related to di by dt. And you remember how to solve a differential equation, right? You solve it by knowing the answer, right? OK, you ask the math department, who's done all that hard research on what are all the solutions of these differential equations. So you solve it by knowing the answer. In this case, the answer is that I need a, de a decaying exponential. OK, so I need something that's e to the minus something times time. So in this case, to solve that equation, I need e to the minus resistance times time over L. And you can imagine then that as I take the time derivative of that, resistance over L comes down in front, and that resistance over L cancels that L, and I get resistance on both sides. Okay, so that solves that uh, equation. So think about what's going on, though. If I lump this all together, I have time, okay, and, and the time is being balanced by something else that's got units of time. Remember, you can't exponentiate anything with units, so this combination, resistance times time divided by inductance, is unitless. Therefore, if this is time, t, that means that L over R also represents something with units of time. Does that make sense? L over R must have units of time, otherwise I couldn't exponentiate the, the total. So L over R has units of time, and it turns out to be the time constant of that solenoid. So the time constant means that it, it, it controls, the time constant controls how fast that exponential changes, OK? So maybe I try to change the current, and then the current will ramp up like an exponential and then 
and then it'll um, trail off to its steady state case, okay? If I have a short time constant, it's gonna ramp up quickly and reach its, its saturation state quickly. If I have a long time constant, it's gonna ramp up really slowly and take a while to reach its steady state. So high inductance means long time constant, okay? So high inductance would be a really slow ramp up of this thing. And so high inductance takes longer to reach steady state. This is actually why inductors are used to filter out high frequency noise. So if you look at antennas carefully, just look, look at a big antenna the next time you see one, you might see at the bottom of the antenna, there's a few turns of wire. The turns of wire are there to be a little teeny tiny inductor and the inductor doesn't like to change its current quickly. So what that means is that you'll put an inductor at the base of an, of an antenna in order to filter out high frequency noise that's running everywhere in our wireless culture. Okay, we're done for today and I'll see you guys next week. <laughs>